Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is James Wright, President Emeritus of Dartmouth College. He is also a U.S. Marine Corps veteran and a, the author of multiple books on military history. His most recent work is Enduring Vietnam, An American Generation and Its War. And sir, thank you very much for being with us. I'm delighted to be here with you, Greg. Well, let's start with a little bit of your background. Where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born in Wisconsin, in Madison, but I, I, I grew up in Galena, Illinois, an old mining town on uh, right a mile from the Mississippi River. And uh, I went to high school there and uh, joined the Marines when I was 17 with four of my high school classmates. Uh, this was in 1957. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, most kids faced the draft of, of my high school graduating class. There were 25 boys, 12 or 13 of us joined the military, five of us joined the Marines right out of high school. And uh, I served three years in the Marine Corps. Galena, if I'm not mistaken, was the home at one time of President and General Grant, is that correct? It was. It was his home before the Civil War. He marched off there with a lead miner regiment uh, to the <laughs> Civil War and went uh, south uh, to where he fought uh, down the Mississippi River campaigns at first. Why'd you join the Marine Corps? Well, my dad was in the Army in World War II. Uh, but Galena had a, did have a, a Marine culture. Obviously, there were a lot of other... It was a, it was a you know, going into the service was just part of what we thought of growing up. Uh, more of us went into the service than went to college, or at least went uh, directly to college out of my high school graduating class. But I, I grew up with uh, John Wayne and the Sands of Iwo Jima and Leon Urs's Battle Cry uh, book. Uh, I, uh, uh, the, the class that would have been seniors when I was a freshman from that high school, I think, uh, eight or nine of them joined the Marines upon graduation. It was just, uh, it was uh, part of the culture back there. And mm -hmm. I had always wanted to be a Marine. I'm not sure I knew what it meant to be a Marine, but I always wanted to be a Marine. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, pleased to have served. It was peacetime. Uh, nobody ever fired a weapon at me and nobody ever asked me to fire a weapon at another person. So it was, a, it was uh, not a war. I was not in combat at all. So once you, you joined, I assume you went through Marine Corps basic. I did. I went through boot camp. Uh, and uh, the, anyone who goes to boot camp and uh, would deny that they aren't regretting very much what they have agreed <laughs> to do is, I don't think, being quite honest with you. Boot camp was, was, a, was a pretty strenuous place. In the, in the 50s, uh, it was still a place with, uh, with, with, with some physical punishment, uh, certainly. Uh, and uh, I... Uh, uh, I enjoyed uh, having done it. Uh, I did not enjoy doing it. <laughs> so, you, did you ever seriously contemplate quitting? Not really. I don't know how you know, it would have been difficult to quit. I don't know that anyone ever considered that. Uh, and, and there were no acts of rebellion. I mean, people learned uh, early on that if a drill instructor said something, you better say yes, sir, uh, <laughs> rather than challenge. And uh, I, I was uh, smart enough to learn that lesson early on. Uh, I was uh, one of the bigger guys in, in my uh, platoon, so uh, I often was selected for uh, demonstrations. Uh, if they wanted to demonstrate hand-to-hand -hand combat, they would bring out uh, these uh, you know, relatively small, wiry, instructors and they would select me to demonstrate how a small person can throw a big person all around the place and uh, they would manage to do that. So I, <laughs> I had first-hand experience on learning those drills. Where did you get assigned during your time after uh, boot camp? I was, I, I was, I went actually into Marine Aviation. I served with the, uh, with MAG-13, Marine Air Group 13, uh, in Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii. Uh, we were part of the 1st Marine Brigade. I was uh, with a close air support helicopter uh, uh, radar unit, and we also had what we called a heli team that I was on that could go uh, into presumably uh, uh, at, 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 the, at the battle lines or behind enemy lines and uh, set up a, a radar unit uh, to provide guidance for close air support. So. Uh, that was an interesting e experiment uh, that I was part of there, and uh, I enjoyed uh, my work with uh, with Mag 13. We were deployed to Atsugi, Japan, in uh, 1958 during the Kemoi Matsu uh, crisis, and uh, they moved some uh, Marine units from Okinawa and Japan down to. Uh, 
Taiwan, down to Formosa, as it was still called. And uh, they moved some of our units uh, to Japan as backup in case uh, there were any incidents there. So I got to spend several months in Japan, and I enjoyed very much uh, that deployment. I was at Atsugi uh, Naval Air Station in Japan. So once you left the service, obviously, eventually your life uh, turned towards academia, given uh, you became... I, d I decided to go to college, uh, and uh, nobody in my family had a college degree at that time, and uh, I thought, uh, why not? We didn't have a GI Bill then. Later, uh, there would be a, what they was called the peacetime GI Bill, which provided some support for my generation of veterans. But I, I worked and went to college, didn't know if I could do college-level work. I had never... Uh, really uh, applied myself, uh, to be honest, and uh, I worked hard and uh, did well. Uh, I uh, continued uh, having to work while I was in school. I was a night watchman, I was a, a bartender, I was a, a janitor, and in the summers I worked uh, for a mining company uh, nearby. I was, uh, including uh, working underground, I was a powderman. In a, in a deep mine, uh, setting dynamite charges. And uh, when I, uh, I was working underground and then the shift boss said to me, I need a powderman, do you want to do this? And I said, I don't know anything about dynamite. I'd never handled a stick in my life. And he said, you were in the Marines. And I said, so what? I still never handled dynamite. And he said, I'll give you 20 cents or 25 cents more an hour. And I said, you mean you'll pay me 235 an hour? And he said, yep, I will. And I said, you've got yourself a powder man. So I, <laughs> I set dynamite charges. Impressive. And where in the country was that? This was in Galena, Illinois, yeah. southwestern Wisconsin, northwestern Illinois, the old lead mining uh, district. But we were mining zinc then. Uh, okay. Zinc was deeper uh, than the lead. But uh, we were mining uh, zinc mines then. And, and uh, during the 60s, uh, it was still, uh, they, they had, uh, economically a uh, pretty strong time for that mining industry, but by the late 60s, as, as demand dropped off, uh, uh, as the Vietnam War closed down, uh, as uh, more and more mining was being done, not just in the West, but in Mexico and South America, all the mines eventually closed down there. So if you graduated from high school and joined the Marine Corps in 1957, you're about 25 or so when American involvement in Vietnam really ramps up. Uh, what, what are you thinking at that time and, and as, as Well, the I remember when uh, the Tonkin Gulf uh, attacks uh, and alleged attacks occurred in August of 1964, uh, I was working underground at the Burkett Mine and uh, we would uh, uh, have uh, our lunch break down there. It was uh, actually an old bus that they had moved down that uh, sat there that uh, provided some enclosure. These were damp uh, mines and it kept us dry and there was a little heater in there. And we would sit there on these benches and have a lunch that we brought down in our lunch boxes. And uh, we got talking about uh, the, the Gulf of Tonkin and everybody applauded uh, President Johnson uh, for what he had done. So this And is I did too. I, we thought it was the, the right move. This knowing is, what we knew then, certainly. So this is your generation uh, that went to war. As you point out in the book, the average age of enlistment and draftee is around 20 and 21. But this is essentially your generation. They is. They're a little bit younger. I, I wasn't technically a baby boomer. I was born in 1939. But mm -hmm. yes, it was. And, and so as you watch that unfold, you know, when it first starts 1964, the, the campus unrest, uh, there obviously had been some racial unrest, but not like it was in the later 60s. So what was it like to watch that unfold well, with your I, generation on the yeah, battlefield? I, I was very lucky in that I, I, once I applied myself, it turned out I was a pretty good student. And uh, I, had, uh, I was a history major, and faculty members uh, encouraged me to think about going to graduate school. Uh, and I got a, a wonderful Danforth graduate fellowship, and I went to the University of Wisconsin. And I started there in the fall of 1964. And uh, I uh, was there. The, the Vietnam War, the, the infantry war, really began in a substantial way in March of 1965 when President Johnson uh, sent uh, Marines into Da Nang and then followed uh, that spring with substantial buildup of uh, Army, infantry, and cavalry, and, and uh, paratroopers. Uh, 
in uh, Vietnam, and there were major battles, the Adrang Valley, uh, even later that year. Uh, and uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I was, there was protest. The protest was really directed at uh, the administration. Uh, people challenged the, the rationale for the war. Uh, I don't can't I don't recall that I that I thought that much about it then. But within a year or two, I certainly uh, questioned the rationale for the war, and part of that was a recognition that. Uh, that uh, the reasons why we thought we went in there weren't seeming to hold up. Uh, the war was proving more costly than anyone had predicted. Uh, American casualties were increasing substantially, and there was uh, a recognition that uh, many South Vietnamese civilians were being killed. And so there, there was a lot of protest on the Madison campus. I didn't uh, participate in that. I didn't grab signs and march around and join them. Uh, in, in later years, as some of the protests also was directed toward the troops that were fighting over there, I had trouble with that because I thought of these as kids that you know, were only a few years younger than me, and I, I fully understood and sympathized with them. I didn't sympathize with uh, Lieutenant Calley or the people that were engaging in, uh, in, in horrible atrocities uh, over there, but uh, I, I was confident that most kids we're not doing that, but what, it was a very difficult time. I came to Dartmouth as a faculty member in 1969, and uh, in 1970, when President Nixon sent the, the troops uh, into Cambodia, there were men, then there was the shootings at Kent State and Jackson State. Uh, there were a lot of protests on campus, and I even came down to Washington with a group of students. We didn't go on a march, but we met with various people on the hill and elsewhere and really uh, shared with them some of our concerns about the war in Vietnam. James, let's pause right there. We'll take our first break. Okay. We're talking with James Wright. The book is Enduring Vietnam and we'll get to that right after this break on Veterans Chronicles. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, joined today by James Wright, author of Enduring Vietnam. And sir, we talked about your experience in the service and, and what you were doing uh, as the war played out. What was the ultimate trigger for your passion for telling the story of the Vietnam veteran? Was it from that era or people you got to know later on? I think it was something that, that really evolved uh, later. Uh, after the Vietnam War ended, uh, there, there was not a lot of focus uh, in this country on wars. Uh, we obviously had Desert Storm. We had uh, other uh, other instances that were short-lived and uh, there was not a lot of focus on it. And uh, in, in 2004, I remember watching uh, footage uh, on television of the Battle of Fallujah where Marines were involved in some very heavy fighting uh, in that city in November of 2004. Uh, a local uh, kid, the son of uh, somebody that worked uh, at Dartmouth in the electrical shop, a young Marine was killed over there. And uh, I uh, you know, expressed my condolences to the family. I was president of Dartmouth at that time. And, and I was just struck because these, uh, these kids in, uh, over in Fallujah were basically my age. They were, in fact, a few years older than I was when I was in the Marines. They are basically the age of my students. And I was talking to a Marine veteran uh, that I knew, uh, an older Marine veteran, and said, I'd like to try to figure out something to do to help them, and he said, why don't you go visit the hospital? So I came down to Bethesda Naval Hospital, as it was then, in uh, the summer of uh, 2005. And uh, over the next uh, eight or nine years, I made 30 visits to there and to Walter Reed hospitals, and I basically would go bed to bed uh, talking uh, to these young men and women uh, would ask them what happened to them and uh, would encourage them to continue their education. I helped to set up uh, a counseling program that's still in existence at Walter Reed Hospital. I raised the money uh, for that uh, to encourage kids to continue their education. And uh, at Dartmouth, we started admitting more veterans and uh, they did uh, very well at Dartmouth. After I stepped down from the presidency in 2009, I wasn't exactly certain what I was going to do, but I wanted to continue my work with veterans. And I, I spoke that year at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. I was honored to be invited to speak here 
on uh, Veterans Day 2009. And I, I told the audience that, that we have an obligation to remember those whose names are on the wall. They, they have to be more than names uh, carved into stone. We have to remember them as uh, young men and women with a whole life full of dreams and plans ahead of them. And, and uh, we need to do that for them. We need to do it for history. And we need to do it for those uh, who would send the young to war. These, these, are, these are real real young Americans were asking to do this. Uh, I would later write an op-ed piece about the idea of boots on the ground, which I have great difficulty with. Politicians and pundits use it. It's a, it's a metaphor. Uh, and uh, I keep reminding people we're not talking about shoe leather. We're talking about flesh and blood when we engage in war. Uh, I wrote a book in 2012, Those Who Have Borne the Battle, which is a history of America's wars and those who fought them. And it tells the story of how we treated veterans and, and wars for beginning with the American Revolution and going through Afghanistan. I had a chapter in that book on Vietnam. And uh, after I finished it, uh, I was not intending to write another book, but Vietnam kept uh, nagging at me. And, and uh, I uh, realized that I needed to do more than write an op-ed, and I found myself writing another book, and I wanted to tell the story of those who served there, because I, I think that we look back at Vietnam as, as a mistake. Uh, uh, we look back on it uh, critically. We look back on it negatively. And as, as I've said, uh, uh, there, there, there may not have been any heroes that came out of the Vietnam War, but there was plenty of heroism there. And I just wanted to tell the story of these kids who served. Uh, I, uh, last fall, my wife Susan and I uh, saw the play Hamilton on Broadway, and uh, I was uh, uh, struck by one line in there uh, that Eliza Hamilton, uh, talking about her late husband, uh, said, who lives, who dies, who tells your story? And uh, th those lines keep ringing for me, because that's what war is about. We can never talk about shoe leather. We can never uh, pretend that it's about some sort of a diplomatic game. We can't think about shock and awe and drones. It's about who lives and who dies. It's not just an incident. It's not just something incidental from war. It is the purpose of war, who lives and who dies. And so we have to tell their story. And I, I really think it's terribly important to remind people of who it is that we're asking to go to war. So I've, I've been trying to tell that story for the kids in Iraq and Afghanistan, and here for this book on Vietnam, I interviewed 160 people, and I try to tell the story of those who served in combat in Vietnam. And we'll take another break here in, in just a moment. Uh, I really want to get your thoughts when we come back from the break about how most of the veterans feel, not only about how they were treated when they came home, but as you point out in the book, about the fact that people just a lot of times didn't even seem to care. Uh, in addition to the scorn that was aimed at them. So we're talking with James Wright. The book is Enduring Vietnam. I'm Greg Corumbus, Veterans Chronicles. We'll be right back. This is Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined in studio today by James Wright, President Emeritus of Dartmouth College, Marine Corps veteran, and the author most recently of Enduring Vietnam. And sir, one of the reasons I would imagine that Vietnam veterans would be appreciative of you devoting an entire book uh, to their stories is perhaps twofold, maybe even more so, but particularly how they were received when they came back from the war. Uh, it, it's well known, and it's perhaps a stain on, on the nation from that era, that they were not only reviled, they were spit on, they, couldn't, they felt like they couldn't even wear their uniforms in public. But as you point out in the book, uh, in many ways, uh, people, once they came home, they found out their fellow countrymen didn't care that much. Talk about that a little bit and, and how much those wounds still sit with them. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. The, 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 there were plenty of examples and instances of outright hostility. Uh, I think that some of those stories uh, have become exaggerated over the years. Part of it was exaggerated at that time uh, by uh, people who used it as a means to sort of be dismissive of the anti-war movement saying they, they, they're spitting on our veterans, that's the, uh, you don't follow them, don't do what they're doing. Uh, some veterans uh, did have very difficult uh, uh, things happen to them, but uh, most that I interviewed, uh, at least, and, and most that I've read about, 
uh, didn't, uh, except that there was this, this air, of, air of hostility, of embarrassment, and uh, there was indifference. Uh, they, were, they were stunned uh, that people uh, didn't seem to want to talk to them about Vietnam. Now, it's true that, that most veterans who come back from war, and the people that I interviewed were combat veterans. I really wanted to talk to those who have been involved in the fighting there. So I talked to uh, Marines uh, who had been in combat, Army infantry and paratroopers who had been in combat. And this was only about 25% of those who served in Vietnam were actually in combat situations. So I was not dealing with a whole cross-section. But I wanted to talk to those who had been there, who had been involved in the fighting, and have been with friends when they died because I wanted to tell their stories. And some of these uh, guys that, that I interviewed had never really spoken about this over the years, but they're willing to be interviewed by me because I want to tell the story of what it was like for them, and I want to tell the story of some of their friends who died, and they want to, to help uh, tell that story. Uh, they did talk about hostility coming home, but yeah, I remember a, an army nurse's story about uh, going to her hometown and the local parish uh, had a, a potluck dinner with a big welcome home sign, and she realized uh, after the evening was over that nobody once asked her about Vietnam. Uh, somebody else said, uh, you'd think I've been to Florida. Somebody commented about my suntan, and other than the short hair, I looked like somebody who had just been on vacation. And uh, they, uh, they didn't ask me where I had been or what I had been doing. Uh, one Marine uh, came home, and his father had been a veteran of World War II, including Iwo Jima. And uh, he realized his father never once said to him, so how was it? What did you do? And uh, there was this, I think it was this, that, that troubled them. Not that they were eager to talk about the, the vicious, nasty, cruel, and gory details of war. Very few people are, certainly when they're fresh in their mind, uh, they're not. But they, they would have liked to have had some acknowledgement. And I think it was this that hurt them a lot. And there was a retrospective in the 1970s where everything uh, the, every, all of the veterans are kind of looked at in hindsight through Lieutenant Callie and Me Lai. I think it's a great tragedy that uh, the name of the person serving in Vietnam, who was probably best well known in the 1970s and 80s, was Lieutenant William Callie, uh, who uh, led the, the unit that, that, that assaulted and slaughtered women and children and older people at uh, the village of Milai, a horrible story, but that was the name that was remembered. People didn't know the others. There were, as I said, there were, there were, there were, there were pl plenty of, there was plenty of heroism in Vietnam. There was a lot of courage as much as in any war, but these did not become part of the narrative. These did not become part of the story. Uh, movies such as Apocalypse Now, uh, be, you know, famous uh, movies, uh, very well done technically. Uh, people uh, thought this represented uh, the Vietnam experience. Uh, it did not. Uh, it, uh, I, I describe Apocalypse Now as Vietnam meets Woodstock. Uh, it, was not, it was not the Vietnam uh, War. Now, people who were involved in that movie have disputed me on that, but that's okay. Uh, it was not the Vietnam War. So what is it most of all that they want us to know? Uh, you mentioned they don't want to get into the exact details, but as you mentioned, her heroism, fighting for the guy to the left and to the right of you, just like any other American war. Um, so what is it that they want us to know about it and hopefully appreciate? I, uh, that's, a, that's a terribly important question. I don't know that anyone ever explicitly said that, that they would like to be recognized for what they did. What they did is that they stood up and served. This, the, the, these were the baby boomers. Uh, these were the kids whose fathers fought in, in World War II. Uh, these were the kids that were brought up uh, and told, uh, you're, when your country calls, you have to serve. These were the kids who were brought up uh, in a world that said, uh, we're threatened by the Soviet Union. We've got to take a stand against communism. We can't make a mistake like we did with Hitler at Munich and other places by making concessions to him. We have to stand up and fight. And so when they were asked to serve, they did. Forty percent of the baby boom generation served in the military. Uh, ten ten percent uh, served in uh, Vietnam. When I say the baby boom generation, I mean the men of that generation. Uh, there are more of them whose names are on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall who died in Vietnam than went to Canada or went to jail 
for evading the draft. I, I'm, I'm not minimizing uh, those uh, who, who, who did not want to go, who did evade the draft, found ways to do that. Obviously, uh, many did. But I do want to point out that a lot of those kids, uh, when they were asked to serve, uh, they did. Uh, they may not have been eager, uh, but many of their fathers were not eager to go off to World War II. But uh, you're asked and, you, and uh, you're called uh, and you serve. And, and that's what they did. And, and they served uh, bravely. Uh, they, they, they very quickly were disillusioned, I think, in most cases by the rationale for the war. Uh, and so they weren't fighting for, uh, as one said, for God and country. We were fighting for each other and for ourselves. But in, in truth, if you if you'd talk to World War II veterans uh, about their war, many of them would have said the same thing. They, they, they obviously had a, an enemy, an antagonist, and Hitler. They wanted a revenge on the Japanese for Pearl Harbor. But most of these kids who fought in World War II would also say we weren't thinking of those things. We we're thinking about uh, looking out for ourselves and looking out for our friends. We we're thinking about uh, that day's uh, mission and trying to do it well, not wanting to embarrass ourselves, not wanting to hurt somebody else. And uh, it's uh, when you're in combat, it's, it's, uh, you don't have a huge worldview. Most of the kids that I talked to about this said they'd never spent any time in Vietnam talking about the politics of the war or the reasons for the war. They, they, they were there uh, to fight a war and they were there to hopefully to come home from it in a year and that's what they uh, that's what they focused on. In addition to the scores of interviews that you did you also made a trip to Vietnam I believe in 2014 uh, went specifically to Hamburger Hill and I'm sure many other places there. Explain why you did that trip and, and how it helped you understand them better. Well because I'd, I'd never been to Vietnam uh, in, in my life, and I knew when, because I was interviewing these people and telling the stories of these battles and these incidents, I, I wanted to see these places. And most of the combat, there was plenty of it on the coast uh, and around villages, obviously, but most of the heavy fighting was in the Central Highlands uh, and up in what was called I Corps, that area uh, north uh, of, of Da Nang up to the demilitarized zone and west uh, to Laos and, uh, and the Cambodian border. And I wanted to go there and so I arranged uh, with military historical tours. I had my own uh, guide, I had an interpreter and a driver and we headed off for the back country and I visited uh, places that I was writing about. Uh, yeah, I went, to, I saw Mudder's Ridge, uh, I saw the rock pile, I saw Razorback. I saw Quezon, I, I walked along the old airstrip at Dok Tho, where the 299th engineers had a terrible fight in 1969, and I climbed Hamburger Hill, uh, because uh, I, I have a chapter in my book on Hamburger Hill, it's the only extended battle discussion in the book, but Hamburger Hill was representative of so many things in that war and the controversy over the war, and so I wanted to climb the hill and go to the top. Uh, I did, and uh, that morning before I went up, uh, I met with a couple of North Vietnamese veterans who had fought there against the Americans. I met in the village of Alawi in the Asha Valley and asked them if they'd climb the hill with me, and they agreed to do that. And uh, it was a, a terrible climb. It was a slippery, steep, difficult, hot, humid climb, and I wondered how these kids uh, had done it in 1969, and, and it was not sufficient to say I was 50 years older than them. Uh, I was not carrying uh, 60 pounds of equipment, and I was not having people shoot at me from the top. We made it in two hours. Those who came in and made it to the top made it in about 10 days, but uh, only some of the units that went in that first day had 70 or 80 percent casualties. I got to the top, uh, and uh, we sat there to catch our breath, and I with the interpreter told the North Vietnamese soldiers a story. I talked about growing up in Galena, Illinois, and I said Galena is the Latin word for lead sulfide. Uh, and I said I worked in the mines there, and while working in the mines, uh, my, one of my bosses was a World War II veteran who had a Purple Heart uh, serving in the Army in Europe, and I got to know his son, who was a great kid. And I, I really liked him. He was, well, he was an English student, and he was thinking about different things he wanted to do. He was drafted, went to the Army, and on June 14, 1969, he was killed as an Army sergeant uh, in the assault on Hamburger Hill when he received a rocket-propelled grenade to the chest and uh, died there. 
uh, I told the soldiers, uh, the North Vietnamese veterans, about him. And I pulled from my pocket something that I'd kept on my desk since I worked at the Graham Mine in, uh, back in 1963, 64. And it was a piece of glena of lead sulfide. And I said to them, I told them what it was, and said, this is a piece of our hometown of Galena. And my friend did not make it to the top of this hill, but now a piece of his hometown is at the top of this hill, and it's going to stay here. And I buried it there, and I assured them that this lead sulfide would endure longer than the red clay of <laughs> Dong Appia uh, would endure there. And so, so doing this brought so many things personally, professionally, emotionally together for me. And uh, I just want to tell the book of this young kid and others uh, like him uh, who had served so bravely and so well. They were asked to serve and they did. And they served well. And I think it's time uh, for us to, to talk about them more and to talk to them more and to encourage them to talk to us more. I received a nice note from uh, somebody uh, just recently who had read my book and said thank you for telling the stories that, that us combat veterans cannot tell ourselves. And I wrote back to him I said, I'm pleased to have had a role in this, but, but you can tell the story yourselves. You must tell the story yourselves. And we have to encourage people to tell the story. They're not going to get into the gory detail with us, but uh, they have some stories to tell, and, and we need to sit down and listen to them. A couple minutes before our next break here, uh, Mr. Wright. So as you put this together, and obviously there's personal stories like the, the young man you knew from Galena that, that I'm sure are at the forefront of your mind. But as you listened and you researched and you put these together, is there one or two where that, that just made you sit back in your chair and just took your breath away that it kind of crystallized what it meant to be a young man serving with courage in that era? Yeah, there are still, quite honestly, parts of this book that, that I read and I get choked up. <laughs> reading and it's not reading my own words but reading my accounts or my quotes uh, and particularly I think this is for the people who had the knock on the door uh, and uh, were told that somebody wasn't coming home. I, I tell the story uh, a few times about uh, this one person I spoke to who was a young teenage boy. He didn't go to Vietnam. His brother was in Vietnam, lived in a small town in Pennsylvania and he was maybe 14 or 15 and there was uh, a knock on the door and he looked and there were two soldiers at the front door. And uh, they asked to see his parents and he said they weren't home but they had called re just before that and they were going to be home in 10 or 15 minutes and he said you're welcome to wait for them and they said they'd sit on the porch. And he joined them on the porch and he said uh, I have a brother that's in the army. Uh, my brother is in Vietnam. He's a helicopter pilot. I'm so proud of him. I got a letter from him the other day. He's going to be home, coming home in a couple of months. I can't wait to see him. Do you know my brother? And they really didn't answer him. And of course, as when his parents came home, these soldiers had to tell him uh, and them that uh, their son would not be coming home, that he was killed when his helicopter was shot down. This young man, uh, said he ran up in the woods and just wept and wept and wept thinking about his brother and thinking of how embarrassed he was for pushing them. To, Do you know my brother? And, and in many ways that, that stands for me as, as an important reminder of what this is about. The, the question, you know, I'd like more of us uh, to when we're thinking about uh, uh, Mrs. Hamilton's uh, story, who lives, who dies, who tells your story. I'd like more of us to be able to answer the question, do you know my brother? Yeah, there are a lot of brothers, there are a lot of sons, there are a lot of spouses, there are a lot of fathers uh, who died in Vietnam. And we just have to know them uh, more. And uh, we can fight about the war. I don't try to justify the war. I'm pretty critical in my book of those who took us to war, but let's step back from that and think about those kids who served there and what they did. Sir, uh, powerful, powerful narrative there. Thank you so much for being here. We'll be right back with more with James Wright. The book is Enduring Vietnam. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. I'm Greg Corumbus. Thanks for being with us. Honored to be joined in studio today by James Wright. He is the President Emeritus of Dartmouth College 
and he is a military historian and a, very active with American veterans, particularly from the Vietnam era. His most recent book is Enduring Vietnam. And sir, you've mentioned uh, throughout our discussion today that the main takeaway from this book and the other work that you do is to know who these people are, what are their stories, not just a, not just a name on a wall or a, a, a number uh, of casualties and so forth, or, or even those who served and came home. Um, but these are real people and real families' lives were changed. What's the main takeaway, perhaps besides that, that you hope people take away from this book? Yeah, if I could just offer one, one modest qualifier. I used, you described me as a military historian. <laughs> My training is not as a military historian. It's really an American political history mm -hmm. and the American West. And most of my writing has been about politics, but it's only over the last 10 years that I've turned to these uh, topics. And it's, it's less military history and more about those who have fought in the wars. And then there is a, a, a distinction there. I think that, that what I try to take away from looking back at the Vietnam War and thinking about the kids who have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, our current wars, is that there needs to be some sort of a military uh, end game. Uh, when we went into Vietnam, Lyndon Johnson really assumed that if he, if he flexed uh, America's military muscle, that North Vietnam would come to the negotiating table and we could get all of this resolved. Uh, Nixon uh, thought the same thing. Uh, it turned out that Nixon did manage to have a negotiation, but it ended up with a, with a peace that didn't last very long, and many people predicted that at the time. I think that uh, we didn't understand the resolution of Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese, and we didn't understand, I think, uh, uh, just how, how difficult the political situation was in South Vietnam. There has to be an end game. The, the battles in Vietnam uh, were small unit battles. They were about flexing muscle. They were about taking casualties. They were about you know, the, this, this atrocious, immoral idea of body counts. Uh, there, there, there was no, no equivalent of uh, landing at Normandy Beach and rushing across the plains of of Western France to liberate Paris and having the villagers waiting to be liberated. There was no equivalent of uh, rushing up uh, Mount Suribachi and raising the flag over Iwo Jima. There were no flags raised in Vietnam. There were very few sustained battles. There were, there were small unit activities and it was to keep pressure on. And, and I don't think that anyone quite had in mind this would be the military resolution. In fact, Nixon said we're not looking for a military uh, resolution here. Uh, the same is true, really, in Iraq and Afghanistan. I wrote an op-ed piece uh, in 2013. It would have been 10 years after President Bush landed on the aircraft carrier, the Abraham Lincoln, and then the, the, the crew there had put up the sign on the ship, uh, Mission Accomplished. The President didn't put this up. He later acknowledged he was somewhat uncomfortable and even embarrassed by it. And uh, people really poked fun of him, and, and worse, for this idea of mission accomplished as the war continued in Iraq, as it continued to even get worse after that. Uh, I pointed out that, ironically, when, uh, when President Bush had landed on that aircraft carrier, uh, the, mis the military mission had been accomplished. Uh, the military that had gone in there in March of 2003 uh, had managed to uh, topple uh, Saddam Hussein's government. They had managed to conclude the search, fruitless as it turned out, for weapons of mass destruction. Nobody knew quite what they were going to do next. Uh, we had done the same thing in, in Afghanistan. We had toppled the Taliban sympathetic government uh, there, the one that was working with al-Qaeda. Nobody quite knew what to do next, uh, and we still have troops in both of those countries, and, and Vietnam was sustained. I think if you send in the military, you have to know what is the military objective? What are they uh, going to accomplish? In Desert Storm, we did that, and President George Bush pulled the troops out uh, as soon as we'd pushed Saddam Hussein out of uh, Kuwait. Uh, there has to be a clear military objective. Uh, the American military today is remarkably well-trained, well-disciplined, professional, have tremendous equipment and resources available to them. They can handle any, any enemy in the field. It's uh, beyond that uh, first day or two you say, okay, what's going, to, 
what's going to happen next. And that's why I worry when people talk about engaging the military in Syria. How, how, what is the end game there? And, and do we really think it's something that, uh, that we can accomplish? Are we asking our military to do something that's beyond their capacity to do? We did that in Vietnam. We've done it in Iraq, Afghanistan. I just urge people to be careful about that and to remind them that we're not talking about shoe leather. We're not talking about boots on the ground. You're talk, we're talking about our, our kids, our sons and daughters. We're talking about people who have signed up, have agreed to serve, are willing to serve their country, are willing to put their lives at risk. Uh, let's make certain that if we ask them to do that, we know exactly what it is that we're intending to do. One of the things that's thankfully changed since Vietnam is that people, regardless of their opinion of the mission, have now been able to separate the mission from the people carrying out the mission. And the appreciation for the troops from Desert Storm up to the present time uh, is 180 degrees different than it was in, in Vietnam. When the Vietnam era men see that, they see the honor flights of the World War II vets coming in, is that something that brings them joy because America has changed for the better, or does it bring back the reminder that they didn't get that? I think there's some of the latter. I think that they do recognize they, they didn't get it, but I think they're, they're delighted uh, at the reception of the kids coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. They're part of those who are welcoming them, welcoming them uh, warmly and proudly, and uh, they, uh, they lead. Uh, veterans organizations today, the VFW, the American Legion, uh, they have significant positions in the VA and they really want to reach out to these kids in ways that they think the World War II generation did not reach out to them and they didn't. Uh, and so they, they do want to reach out. And I do think there is a warmth today. I'm not sure that most Americans today have the slightest idea uh, what it is that we're asking these kids to do. Uh, I don't think anyone has the slightest idea of how difficult it is sometimes. There's still a sense of sort of a TV game drone war and shock and awe and uh, all of these uh, remarkable things that, uh, that uh, k keep the human beings out of the war and uh, they don't. Uh, they won't. Uh, uh, there will be not boots, there will, be, there will be boots on the ground but these boots will be worn uh, by young kids, uh, and these boots are going to step on IEDs. These these boots are going to go into some very difficult places, and uh, we just have to think about that. And most most Americans have no skin in the game. These are the first sustained wars in American history. We have, don't have a tax uh, to pay for the war. We're doing it on debt. The kids who are over there fighting can come home and spend the next 25 years paying for the war that they fought. I think it's uh, it's time for all of us to to step up and say, uh, if, if we're going to ask the kids to fight a war, let's pay for it. Let's look out for them when they come home. I don't think we've done that adequately yet. Last question. Obviously, you spent a lot of time digging into this, meeting people. Uh, you clearly had a passion for this topic leading into the first book that had a chapter on Vietnam and now this book entirely on Vietnam. After going through all this, what's the impact been on you? How has it changed your view of the war, the men, or, or your appreciation? Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's, it's part of what I keep uh, encouraging, I guess, uh, just a greater understanding. I've had the, the, the advantage and sometimes uh, the burden, I guess, of, of, of being so fully immersed in this. There are times when I would be uh, reading my notes or drafting something where I, you know, I would come home and, and uh, my wife would say, how did it go today? And other than uh, fine, I didn't want to say much more about it. It's, uh, it's, it's, so it, it, it would sit there pretty heavily uh, sometimes, and, and it did affect me, uh, you know, and without any pretense of being a participant. But I, 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 had, uh, I had a perspective on it that most people don't have, and uh, I wanted to share that. Uh, and uh, I, I come out of this with even greater admiration for the Vietnam generation. I think I had it before, but I can assure you I have even greater admiration for them, for what they did, uh, and for the way that they have uh, continued uh, to carry the burden in, in so many ways. Uh, that, ge that generation has gone on to do some remarkable things. They provide leadership in, in the political, the economic, the cultural, uh, the intellectual arenas of this country. They, they have contributed a great deal, but they're carrying with them a burden. 
uh, and we could help uh, lift that burden a little bit by talking to them about it and saying more than a thank you for your service. Uh, the, they need more than that. I think they, they need an embrace. They need to know that, that we really do recognize what it is that they did. Mr. Wright, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for being with us, and thank you for sharing your book. Thank you so much, Greg. James Wright, President Emeritus of Dartmouth College, U.S. Marine Corps veteran, author of multiple books on military history. His most recent work is Enduring Vietnam, an American Generation and Its War. I'm Greg Corumbus, reporting for Veterans Chronicles.